Thank you. Um, before I give the floor to Dr. Mesalao, I want you to know that the book will be available and he will be signing books to all those who are interested. Outside on a little table, we still have like 50 copies to go away. Uh, and it's promotional. And I understand that the, the price in Europe was about 25, 30 euros and they're giving it away for 20 dollars here. Having said that, uh, I am very happy, very pleased to give the floor now to Dr. Carmelo Mesalado. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Juan Antonio Blanco uh, for the terrific organization of this uh, presentation. Uh, several, several authorities in Miami State uh, College, uh, Cruz. Uh, and also the staff, uh, which have done a wonderful job. And also my thanks to the co-sponsors, the beautiful words that have been said by my friend and colleague, uh, Jorge Duani from uh, Human Research Institute, uh, Salia Bassan uh, from, the, from NACAI, and also the Association for the Study of the Human Economy. Well, the, the theme of my presentation is, uh, I would say, a little part of, of a book. This is a, it's a long book, it's 336 pages. And essentially it's based on, on that uh, publication, but I have, uh, for this presentation, updated uh, several of the data with uh, recent statistics uh, published in Cuba. The most recent one just three weeks ago. And you have here uh, the summary of my presentation. Uh, first, I, I am going to ask, why is it that Raul Castro is doing this so-called structural reforms in his own words uh, that are, in my opinion, uh, the most important and profound that have been uh, implemented in the 54 years of the revolution? That doesn't mean that they are the most radical within the socialist camp, because China and Vietnam are quite ahead of Cuba. But we think they are, these are the most important ones. The second is there are different types of reforms. And I have uh, grouped them into three uh, categories in order of their importance. So I will go very quickly through that. And uh, the mayor, the core of my presentation, will be uh, a, an analysis as much as I can do with the time limitations that I have on uh, the structural reforms and their, and their effects. And in, in each of these reforms that I will discuss with you, um, I will touch on improvements, uh, obstacles, and effects. And finally, the conclusions and prospects. Now, on, on the first question, uh, why, why the reforms? Well, the reforms are, are essentially due uh, to the accumulation of problems under the leadership of Raul Castro's brother Fidel for 48 years. By the way, we don't have information for 2012. This will take about 12 years, so my data ends in 2011. But you have here 13 reasons. And the first one is that there has been a, a slowdown in economic growth in Cuba since 2008, for instance. Uh, Cuba was the second lowest country in terms of growth rate in Latin America in 2011. Capital formation is very important. It, we, we could call it investment, because part of what you produce has to be safe and invest in order to promote economic growth in the future. And as you can see here, there have been a sharp decline from 25% of the gross domestic product of Cuba in 1989 to only 8% in 2011. Industrial production in 2011 was 45% of the 1989 level. I use 1989 because this is, this is a year prior to the big crisis in the 1990s. As you recall, the Soviet Union collapsed and it was a a benefactor of Cuba in many different uh, ways. And sugar output that used to be the major export of Cuba shrank from 8 to 1.3 million tons 
between 89 and 2011. Agricultural production is one of the worst areas of the economy in Cuba, and production in 2011 was below, well below 1989, 22 years ago, and also below 2007. On the other hand, oil, gas, and nickel increased many, many times above the level of 1989. However, they have been stagnant since 2006, 2008. And also, tourism is one of the big successes of the revolution. Many, many times increases in the number of tourists and, and high income, uh, high currency revenue. Uh, but the occupancy rate of uh, hotels in Cuba have been declining from 64 to 53 percent. Also, there have been a deficit in the trade balance. We, when you have when the value of your exports is lower than the value of your imports, you get a deficit. Otherwise, you get a surplus. In Cuba, there have been systematic deficit throughout the revolution, except for one year. And this deficit reached a historical record of $11 billion in 2008. It declined a little bit, but still it was $7 billion uh, in 2011, which is the second highest in the history. And Cuba would not have been able to continue if it were not for $13 billion in trade and aid and investment from Venezuela. And so that you have an idea of the magnitude, I am talking about one year, $13 billion in one year. Uh, this is more than twice uh, the help of the Soviet Union uh, at the best point in the relationship between the two countries in 1985. Of course, we, you know, we have to adjust for inflation, but even so, uh, this is a, a huge uh, support for Cuba. Now, in the social arena, uh, real wages, meaning wages adjusted annually for the inflation rate, declined 72% in 1989, 2011. That means that in 2011, the persons in power of the Cuban workers was only 22% of what it was prior to the crisis. And there have been, Cuba reached a peak in the social service, and I said it, you have the, some of the best social indicators of all Latin America and many socialist countries by 1989. But after that, the crisis, uh, took a toll in these uh, services. There have been a steady deterioration in their quality. And despite of this, they take a huge cost, which is measured at 53% of the budget in Cuba, as well as one third of GDP. There is nothing in terms of this cost in Latin America and the Caribbean, and many other developing countries in the world. And more than 1.3 million workers in the state sectors are unneeded, according to official figures. By the way, all of this that I am telling you is taken from Cuban statistics. I have, I have devoted more than 50 years of my life working with Cuban data. So I mean, this is, this is not citation for journalists. No, this is our hard data coming from Cuba. And the housing deficit, more than one million units. So here you have uh, a summary of Raul Castro's reforms in this period uh, since he took over from the Fidel in 2006 until December of last year. And Raul himself, in a, in a speech in July 26, 2007, called this a structural reform, meaning deep radical reforms in Cuba. And this prompted a national debate, in my opinion, the most important in the whole history of the revolution, a debate involves not only economists, but political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, even philosophers. And there was a fair consensus emanating from this debate and proposals made to the government uh, from all these, I'm talking about hundreds, of, hundreds and mid thousands of people writing and discussing this issue. So there are three types of, of reforms. As you can see here, uh, they go from the least uh, and, and important and, and, the, and the least complex uh, to the most important and complex. Administrative changes 
they are not really uh, significant, but uh, some of them uh, have some importance. For instance, the campaign against labor indiscipline and corruption that began in 2006 have led to more than 300 top Cuban officials uh, as well as managers of enterprises, including foreign entrepreneurs who are, who are put in jail. And then there have been some open, openness to criticism in Cuba. It doesn't go as far as glasnost as in the Soviet Union, but there are spaces that have been opened up, particularly in magazines from the Catholic Church, which I am honored to contribute, but also by the journal Themas, Themes, which is the most important social science in Cuba. In these publications, there, there are debates and hard criticism of many of the problems of the nation. The novel structural reforms are more important. And here you have many different things. For instance, the possibility of Cuban to access to restaurants and uh, hotels that were banned before. Uh, the government paying back debt, debts uh, to uh, private farmers. Uh, and also paying a higher price, something which is called Cuba acopio, for procurement or selling that these private farmers do to the state. And finally, also the, the possibility of uh, selling to these private farmers and other groups uh, inputs that are needed uh, for their production. And finally, the pension reform of 2008 that I hope to have time to discuss briefly. So we go uh, now to the most important thing, which are the structural reforms. The first thing that I want to mention is the updating of the economic model. In Cuba, this is called actualization. The problem with this is that Cuba continues to a central economy or command economy. And this has been going on for more than half a century. And all the experience that has been accumulated all over the socialist world in the past and the present suggests that this system doesn't work. So they are trying to infuse some market mechanisms in this centrally planned economy. And it, there are several Cuban economies writing in Cuba that have said, what well, it didn't work in 50 years is not going to work now. And I subscribe to that uh, position. So this is a very difficult thing to do this, this mix of predominant central, central planning with the market. The other very difficult thing uh, to accomplish is to terminate rationing. Now, you may think that rationing is a bad thing, but in the context of Cuba, for poor people and low income people, rationing is essential to survive because they get, even if a meager portion, for instance, food only lasts for about 10 days of, of a month, this is essential for their survival. So, terminating rationing is a very difficult thing. And of course, that's the reason why they have not been accomplished. Some steps have been taken, as I will mention later on. For me, the most important structural reform is the distribution of land in usufruct. I will explain the theme, the term later on. And the second one is, I mentioned that there are 1.3 million workers which are unneeded in the state sector, and they have to be dismissed, because there is a huge cost, of very low productivity. Uh, and but in order to dismiss this 1.3 million workers, they have to create jobs in the non-state sector. And, and this is a very difficult issue, although they are advancing in this sense. Gratuities means free things that are given by the state. For instance, free lunches in schools, uh, subsidized cafeterias in, in work centers. And there have been a significant reduction in these gratuities as well as in social services and social welfare. A new thing uh, in Cuba, and beginning in 2011, is the sales of homes and automobiles. And then, in the last six months, there have been an acceleration in the reforms. And you have several four laws that have been enacted. One, the law of migration, uh, the tax reform law, the laws on agricultural cooperatives, and the law of non-agricultural 
and service co co cooperative. Unfortunately, because of li time limitations, I, I won't have time to discuss this recent events, but I will be happy to entertain questions in the answer, uh, question and answer period. So let me go then to the first, the most important for me, uh, reform, which is uh, usufruct. So what is usufruct? This is a word that comes from Latin. I mean, the use or cultivation of land for the people who receive the land, but also the right to appropriate the fruit. That's why usufruct. Uh, the first law was enacted in 2008. A second law, very recent, began, uh, was enforced in December of last year, uh, of 2012. Now, what that means done here? Well, the state had 2.6 million hectares of idle land. That means that there was land that was not in production. So the idea is this country has a very serious problem for such efficiency in food. They have to import about 1.6 a billion dollars every year. The figure for this year is 1.9 billion. And therefore, we have to use this land in order to increase agricultural production uh, in the country. Uh, and 1.5 million hectares have been distributed to 174,000 individuals by the end of last year. This still is only 58% of the total idle land. So uh, still another 42% to go on, but it's, it's an important step. So what happened uh, with this? Well, agricultural production declined by 5% in 2010, and it rose in 2011. This is a difficult assessment. We know that, in general, there was an increasing output, but we don't know exactly where in the non-state sector it was. Certainly, in the state sector, there was a decline in production, and there was also a decline in production in the cooperative sector, so the non-state sector is made up of two groups, which are uh, private farmers and the usufruct farmers. Because the only land that has been expanded is the one in usufruct. My conclusion is that the increase in agricultural production in 2011 was due to usufruct. But still, there are many pending problems that we are going to see. So what are the improvements uh, of that law or the previous one First of all, the, the size of the use of uh, land uh, was extended from 40 to 67 hectares. It's about 167 acres. The contract is the same. Uh, the farmer received uh, this land for 10 years that are renewable for another 10. But look at something quite interesting here. There is a preference of the state uh, against uh, the use of individuals farmers, and those uh, usufructuaries that are cooperative and state farms, because they get 20 years in the contracts. In the, in the law of 2012, it was increased to 25. So if you are in the state of the cooperative sector, you have 2.5 times the period that is granted uh, to individual farmers. Another thing is that investment Whatever improvement uh, the, this uh, this is this used to fruit farmer did in the land, previously it was not clear what happens if the contract is cancelled after ten years. Who is the owner of this? And the law clarified that. Uh, that is an important step. That means that the state will do the assessment because there is a problem that this, there is discretionary power about this. But it does an assessment and this. Uh, value of these resources is, re is given back uh, to the farm. Also, before, it was not possible to build a home or a stable in the farm. And this was crazy because the, the farmer could have their house far away from the land, so he had to walk into, into the land. And then he couldn't protect the animals and the, 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 the birds. Uh, therefore, that, that was a problem. Now, it, it can be actually more than one house. It could be one or two, depending on the number of family workers in the, in the farm. And also, it can have a storage uh, for that. And it could plant woods and, and trees, fruit trees, and this is, uh, belongs to them. Not the land. The land belongs to the state. Um, 
uh, family workers may inherit the use of fruit and the investment. That was not before the, the law of 2012. And uh, finally, they are, the state has been giving uh, small loans uh, to the use of uh, farmers and allow them to open bank accounts. Despite all these improvements, which are significant, I don't want to diminish the importance of them. Agricultural output in 2011 was well below 1989 and even 2007, with a small increase in 2011. And why is that? Well, uh, the contract is terminated if the farmer uh, doesn't have certain level of productivity which is judged by the state, or it does not meet uh, their obligations for the state. But the land also could be seized for reasons of a state interest or social interest. Uh, the farmer has to be tied uh, to a state farm or a cooperative in order to get inputs like seeds, uh, fertilizers, etc., services and commercialization of the product. Uh, it's a little bit ironic uh, because in Cuba, the most productive sectors in agriculture are private farmers. And this is, has been amply demonstrated. And yet, uh, on the other hand, state farms and cooperatives are notorious for their inefficiency. And yet, the government compels the, the use of fruit farmers to be tied to these two entities, and they are not allowed to organize their own cooperatives, as it should be. Half of the land is covered by a thorny bush, extremely difficult to pull out and extract, which is called marabou. But, uh, so that have to, the first thing that the farmer has to do is to clean the land out of this, because if it leaves on roots, it comes back. Uh, and yet, state credit cannot be used to do this job. It can be used for something else, but not for this. And therefore, it's not surprising that out of the distributed land between 33% and 54%, depending on different, two different sources, are not in production in use of fruit. And here comes another problem, which is that the, the farmer has to sell to the state part of the crop at a price which is set by the state below the market price. So if the, if the farmer were free to sell this in agricultural markets that are prices set by supply and demand, uh, he will be earning much more than selling to the state. This is a cost that he has to pay. This is called a copio in Cuba. There are restrictions to hire non-family workers. And the size of investment, this uh, that I discussed before, the maximum is 0.67% of the total parcel, which is ridiculous because what you want is that the farmer invests as much as possible, and then they are limiting the amount of investment that can be done in the land. Unfortunately, 77% of useful fruit farmers lack experience in agriculture. So, you know, the possibilities of success with all these impediments and obstacles is a very difficult one. And I mentioned state micro loans, but just to give you an example, last year there was a total of 130 million pesos uh, given in a small land, out of which only 10% went to useful farmers, self-employed, and private farmers. Therefore, it's a tiny amount in view of the problems that they face. And last but not least, there are very complex regulations to request land, to sign and renew contracts, and to approve investment. I'd like to make a comparison between the Cuban use of fruit with the experience of two other socialist countries, China and Vietnam. Agrarian reform has been crucial in, in these two countries for the progress that they have achieved. China has had the highest economic growth rate in the world for many years. So what are the differences? Well, something common in the three countries is that the land is not transferred. The land keeps in the state hands. But the difference is that in the two Asian countries, the farmer 
can decide what to plant, to whom sell the crop, and it fixes the price. And that's a big difference with the Q1 case, as, as I explained before, because the farmer, also fruit farmer, is in, in large measure pressured by planning to do certain crops. He has to sell part of the crop to the state, and the price is set by say below the market price. Well, in China and Vietnam, which have a history of hunger for centuries, they are now self-sufficient in food. And further than that, they are exporting food. And Vietnam is exporting Cuba 500,000 tons of rice, which is half of the Cuban consumption. Therefore, if Cuba were to follow further in this direction, because in China, the contracts are not 10 years, the contracts are indefinite. There is no, no, no period. I could assure you that in six years, Cuba will be self sufficient in the production of food. Okay, now let me go into the second uh, most important reform. I mentioned already, 1.3 million people are needed, uh, have to be fired. Let me give you an example of what I am talking about here. My, my dissertation in Cornell, written in 1968 about unemployment in socialist countries that was mentioned by Jorge, had a, a hypothesis which is that in socialist countries, in general, and Cuba in particular, open unemployment is significantly reduced. Open means visible, because you create what is called underemployment. Now, let me explain this with an example. Let's say that the government builds a factory, and they need, really, in an efficient manner, 100 workers. But they decide to employ 200. That helps to reduce your open unemployment rate but what happens is that your productivity, labor productivity, climbs by one half, and so does the salary. So you have a problem here, because these people are not productive. They have to be this meat. Socially, this is a problem. Economically, it's the right thing to do. And this is not peanuts. I mean, we are talking about 28% of the labor force. And there is another figure that was quoted before, of 1.8 million workers for 2014, that will be 35% of the labor force. That's higher than the open unemployment rate in Cuba during the Great Depression of the 1930s. So the government set targets. By March of 2011, half a million workers should be dismissed. And by the end of the year, it will be one, one million workers. But what happened? Well, only combining 2011, 2012, only 365,000 workers were dismissed. And that is 36% of the 1 million target in December of 2011, not counting 2012. So obviously, they are well behind the plan. And why? Because the private or non-state sector that have to be created in order to give jobs to all the people that were dismissed from the state sector were simply not created. Now, there have been improvements. The number of self-employed at the end of last year was 400,000. However, you have to subtract from that those that were self-employed already before this new uh, policy began. So we have a net of 253,000. And that is just, remember, we're talking about 1.3, 1.8 million workers, so that's a very small amount. Furthermore, surveys that were conducted in Cuba show that those new self-employed, only 80% have been unemployed or dismissed from the state sector. So we say, who are the others? The others were self-employed that were illegally working before, and they took advantage of the law in order to formalize their business. Also, pensioners, uh, because pension in Cuba is very low, and therefore, uh, these are the, that, these are the, uh, the, the self-employed, not the ones that were dismissed from the state sector. <clears throat> the government also uh, authorized 181 occupations, self-employed occupations, and you may say, wow, that's a lot of people, 
We are going to see, however, what type of jobs are these. And they can hire all the non-family workers that they want to work in with them. And also they increase, you, you think this is a, this is a minute thing, but it's important in Cuba. In Cuba there are small restaurants that are called paladares. I have eaten on them and the food is good. And uh, at the beginning they could only have 12 chairs. So one of the big improvements is now they can have 50 chairs. <laughs> And the self-employed have been allowed, and this is important, to sell directly to the state and to rent from the state certain facilities or installations that were considered inefficient by the state. They are receiving microcredit, and they have some of the taxes that I will be talking in a minute, and they are one of the major problems, have been suspended temporarily. And finally, the government created non-agricultural or service cooperatives. It's the first in Cuba. They began with barbers, hairdressers, manicurists, but at the end of last year, 222 activities were approved. Now, what about the obstacles? There is always obstacles. Concerning the self-employed, you have 181 occupations. But unfortunately, most of these occupations are unskilled. So you're talking about clowns, you're talking about orange peelers in the street, you're talking about people taking care of baths in restaurants and hotels, and there are a couple of, uh, of skilled occupations like translators, but the bulk of the occupation are on skill. And furthermore, graduates from the university cannot work in their profession as self-employee, meaning that a doctor can work as a taxi driver of a restaurant waiter, but cannot work as a physician. And this is a major problem because you need accountants, you need managers, you need business administrators, and those are not allowed to work in their own profession. There is so much regulation and inspection so that if you are a self-employed that are dealing with, for instance, selling food, an inspector may come and find that you have violated some rules and your, your shop is closed down. And the taxes are excessive. Uh, there is a Canadian uh, colleague of mine that estimated uh, that a self-employed in Cuba is paying more taxes proportionally than a capital foreign investor in a mixed company in Cuba. <laughs> Just to give you an idea. And, and the worst is a, is, a, is a tax on the labor force. I, I, when I read this for the first time, uh, I, I have to read it three times because I, I just couldn't believe it, which says that the, you know, depending on the number of people that a self-employed hires, the rate of these taxes goes up and may go up from 25 to 75%. So that, for me, is absolutely counterproductive because the government needs to dismiss 1.3 million people. They have to find jobs in the self-employed and other sectors, and then the government impedes them or, or create this incentive for creation of the jobs that are needed. Uh, credits, insufficient. I mentioned only 10% goes to all this non-state sector. Wholesale markets are very important because these people need to buy inputs, you know, seeds, tools, herbicides, fertilizers, and they, there have been promises, but they have not been established yet. And the opposition of the bureaucracy is restless, it's for, it's incredible. Why? Why? because they have a self-interest. Now, think, if you are the manager of a restaurant that charges high prices, the food is awful. I was with my wife and daughters in, in, in January 2011, the first restaurant that, that, that we went, we simply killing it. And the service is worse. Now, let's say that in, just in the opposite, in the front of this a state restaurant, there is a private paladar that give you excellent food, fine quality, 
for the same or less price. This guy, this manager, have a vested interest that this paladar is not successful. So there, there is a conflict of interest, and this is a major pro problem that Ron Castro has been referring to many, many times in his speeches. And then the cooperative. This is a, an important step in Cuba. But listen, in order for cooperative members to get approval, they have to go through four instances, four different levels of the government. And believe it or not, the final decision is done by the Council of Ministers. You could think that these people have something more important to do than approve the creation of a cooperative. Remember, there are 22 to 122 types of, that doesn't mean number of cooperatives, types of occupation, there will be thousands of cooperatives. How these people are going to do this? It, it blows my mind, I simply I don't understand it. <laughs> and then there are restrictions for hiring workers, and other obstacles similar to those of the second floor. Now I am going to go into an area uh, which is very close to my, really, my major field of expertise, which is, you know, social policy. And, and there are several things that have been done here. I mentioned the elimination of gratuities, uh, cuts in social services, and social welfare. I am going to go quickly, because otherwise I will take too much time. But in salary, you have nominal rises. That doesn't mean adjusted for inflation. So it's still that figure that I gave you at the beginning, you know, 72% uh, lower than 89 states. But there are some things which are important. It is the government legalized payments in hard currency or in convertible pesos that were uh, given to, under the table to employees of mixed enterprises. There was a top in the wage, which was absurd. That top was lifted. Uh, one worker can perform several works and receive a salary for them. And then they introduced something which is called payment by results, in Spanish, the Estado. For all of these things were intended for increasing productivity. And yet, in spite of how important this is, I have been unable to find any results of these positive measures by the end of 2012. So I cannot tell you what is going on. I don't know. Well, and the gratuities I mentioned, the elimination of the workers' cafeterias, associated prices, the rationing have not been eliminated, but the, what the government has been doing is eliminating items, food particularly from the booklet, from the, the libreta, and then they, are, they sell these goods in the, in, the, in the free market at prices that are four or five, five times the price in the libreta. So this is, it means a significant increase in the cost of the family uh, for living. And then there have been increases also in tariffs of public utilities like water, electricity, uh, gas, telephone, etc. Now, social services, I remember I mentioned you, social services have 53% of the budget and one third of GDP. So this is unsustainable. And Raul acknowledged this several times. And he said, this social service has to be support, subordinated to output increases and available fiscal resources, which for me makes all the sense, really. I mean, this is something that has to be done. And there were budget reductions in 2009, 2011, except for pensions, because remember, Cuba, Cuba is one of the, is the second aging, aging population in Latin America, and pensions is a huge cost and rising. What about education? Many of the programs that Fidel created and in my opinion, you know, they were not very rational, to, to be kind, were ended by Raul. The secondary rural schools, the worker persons universities, the social workers, you remember these people that were trained in university and then ended up in, ga in gas stations, you know, trying to control fraud. The so-called emergent teachers that were created in a very short period of time because there was a huge deficit of well-trained teachers, and most uh, municipal universities. Now, this is amazing. There were, Fidel created, in a very short period of time, 3,000 municipal universities. 
in three years. I mean, do you think it's possible? You are in the field of education. Three thousand municipal, they are gone. Thanks heaven they are gone because they were bad. <laughs> and then uh, there was this problem that the students have, you know, basic errors in grammar, uh, etc. And now the university entry exams have been set quotas for the schools, and the exams are restricted. Some students here may not like this, but you know that it's necessary in order to assure quality. And another irrational thing. In these 3,000 municipal universities that, that Fidel created uh, in, in the early uh, century, uh, 21st century, there was a boom in careers that were not connected with development, such as humanities and physical education. I mean, I don't have anything against those careers, but the problem is that at the same time that they were booming, because it was easy to enter, uh, they were cutting down enrollment in the essential disciplines for development, such as natural sciences and math. And the pension reform in 2008, uh, they raised five years in retirement age, and that was necessary because if you have one of the lowest retirement ages, 55 years women and uh, 60 men, yeah, you just imagine here now, 60 there for both sexes, and it was increased five years, and also contribution from the workers were raised. The idea is that with this reform, the deficit in the pension system will be eliminated. Now, let me explain this to you. The revenue that is taken through contributions uh, for pensions are lower than the expenditures. And the difference is 42%. And that 42% is paid by the state. Now, you think that social security problems in the United States are bad. Think about this. <laughs> so the idea was, if we do this, you know, we increase the age of retirement, we, we have more contributions from workers, etc. we are going to eliminate the deficit. My friends, I, yesterday, uh, yesterday, I was working <laughs> with the newest data from the Tatitica uh, Yearbook of Cuba, and there have been no decline. No decline. And we are talking 2011, this was in 2008. Um, my original forecast, and this is my field, this is not going to solve the problem in the long run. Actually, it's going to become worse because of aging of the population. Well, I have to cut this, otherwise I will never end. But let me concentrate on social assistance. This is very, very important. The government did something right, which is they were subsidizing prices in the rationing booklet. And that was good for low income and poor. But look, high income people in the government were also benefiting from a subsidized price. That means that they were buying goods, particularly food, through rationing at a price lower than the cost. And this is unfair. And so the idea is we have to terminate this, and instead of giving subsidies to goods, we are going to give social assistance to those who are in need. This is the right idea. And is this debate in 2007, 2008, all economists and sociologists, etc., agree that this was the right thing to do. So this is right, okay? But on the other hand, many of the reforms have eroded social welfare. For instance, the articles that have been taken out of the rationing booklet are sold three or four times. Articles sold in what the Cubans call shopping, which are hard currency shops went to the roof, the prices, if you can find them. And then you also have cuts in social services, less available for the population. You have uh, the increases in electricity, water, gas, etc. You have houses that now are, I have seen the internet prices of houses that go for $250,000. So all of this is creating problems for low income and poor people. So if the government 
new policy were implemented, what would be the rational conclusion? You have to expand social assistance, right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and one of the things that they did in the sixth Congress of the party uh, in, uh, in 2011 was to say, and you want to read it, they eliminated beneficiaries, beneficiaries of social assistance who have relatives that can help them. But the, you know, think in terms of the United States, if this were the case, I mean, there will, will be a revolt in this country. And let me show you now, uh, with the only, oops, the only figure that I am showing you. Because <laughs> I don't want to bore too much with this. But look, I am comparing 2006 and 2011. Okay? This is the peak and this is the trough. And look at this. Between the two years, the number of beneficiaries as a percentage of the total population declined by 70%. These are official figures from Cuba. I was working on this figure yesterday to update it, because I had it for 2010. And as a percentage of the as a percentage of the budget, it declined in this period 78%. So the policy is right, but the implementation is just the opposite. And there is no social safety net in Cuba. And this means that poverty and the population, the vulnerable population, would expand. Well, I cannot go into the issue of bombs and automobiles and all these things because you, I am going to put you to sleep. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, go, go into the conclusions and prospects. Well, the administrative and not non-structural reforms are the least complex and the least important, but they have had positive results. Very few exceptions. But what about the, the key structural reforms? They are more complex and they are more important. And unfortunately, they have not been successful up to now. I mean, there are, there are some improvements in culture in Yusufruk, but in general, there are no clear, uh, tangible results. And why is that? Because of the obstacles that I have been explaining to you, in spite of all the improvement that I have also uh, discussed. Uh, so you have uh, the case of Yusufruk. Yes, increase in 2011, but still they are below 2007. It's very small in in improvement. Uh, the dismissals of state employees and the creation of private jobs, the goals were not met by a wide margin because of the excessive target taxes, excessive regulations, uh, state control. The elimination of gratuities, uh, goods taking out of rationing, goods in social services, and social assistance are going to further increase poverty and the vulnerable population. And I didn't discuss the sales of home, they have time, and cars, but they are quite important because you can sell a house in Cuba since 2000, 1960, and then now you can do it with some limitations, of course, but this is an important thing. Only 3,000 homes have been sold in Cuba uh, by the end of 2012. It's, it's, it's 11 million people there. So let me finish. So let me finish with this. Raul Castro reforms are positive, and they are well-oriented towards the market, but they are partial, they are slow, they go bit by bit, like trial and error, back and forward. They are embedded with obstacles and excessive regulations and tax burdens that generate disincentive and impede progress of the reforms. They are insufficient to solve the socioeconomic problems 
accumulated in more of 50 years of centralized socialism in Cuba. My analysis indicates that there is a conflict in the leadership that results in an effective compromise. As I say, you see a metaphor that this is like a hybrid. Uh, Raul and the reformists want to push forward, but there are all these, you know, troglodytes and dino dinosaurs there, uh, hardliners that, you know, we have to be careful because if we give too much economic power, uh, then we may lose political power as well, and therefore they put all this regulations and taxes, and, and so this hearing doesn't bear fruit. And I have noticed, however, an acceleration in the last six months in the path of the reforms. And they may, this may be due to three different reasons. One, the lack of substantial results, so they not have to go further. Two, the f this is quite important, the failure to find oil, oil in the high waters of the Gulf of Mexico. There have been three attempts that failed, and that means that the government has less policy space. They can wait less, you know? And finally, but not the, the least important, is Hugo Chavez's very serious illness. If, if Hugo Chavez dies and there are elections and, and the government loses the election, in any case, there is a risk that this huge $30 million uh, aid from Venezuela will be eliminated or reduced. I want to finish making an announcement. Uh, this is going to be my last book, not only on Cuba, but in anything else. And the reason is that uh, despite of what uh, Arondo Dilla said in his uh, review a couple of days ago, I, I no longer have the stamina of an adolescent. I am 78 years old, and really the effort to write a book, and some of you are laughing because I have said this before, <laughs> but I am telling you this is true now because I am feeling it in my bones and in my muscles everywhere. I, I can I can I can keep with this effort because it's it's strenuous, it put me a lot of pressure. And I want to end by thanking my wife Elena, who is here. For, for 48 years, wow. she has supported me, <laughs> and she is responsible for any success that I have had in my life.